Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tarek Masood. I am a professor here at the Kennedy School, the faculty director of our Middle East Initiative, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third in our series of Middle East Dialogues, which is a series of conversations that I've been having with people whom I believe to hold very important perspectives on the war in Israel and Gaza and the state of the broader Middle East. And our guest today is Professor Dalal Saib Araqat of the Arab American University in Palestine. Professor Arqat is a scholar of conflict resolution, international relations, and public diplomacy. She has a doctorate from the Sorbonne, and she's completed additional training in leadership at Stanford and in negotiation here at uh, Harvard. She is a uh, uh, young uh, leader of the world, young global leader of the World Economic uh, Forum, um, and she's written very broadly on the Palestinian-Israeli peace process, the impact of COVID-19 on the occupied Palestinian territories, and on institution building under occupation. She's She's a columnist for Al Quds newspaper, and her work has been published by Haaretz, the Jerusalem Post, the Institute for Palestine Studies, Political Geography, the Palestine Israel Journal, among many other venues. She just arrived yesterday from Ramallah. So she also brings to us a very grounded perspective on what is happening right now. And I'm extremely grateful to her for making time to participate in our series. So many of you have been to these before. You know the drill. We'll talk for about 45 to minutes to an hour. Then I will take questions from my students before opening it to the audience. And I hope we will end by about 1.30. I want everybody to know that the event is being recorded. So if you do ask a question, you are, by participating in that act, offering your consent to having your voice and visage uh, recorded for posterity and uh, spread all over the internet. The other thing I want to tell you to do is uh, even uh, extremely important. Uh, how many of you own a cell phone? Excellent. Could you take your cell phone and turn it off? Okay, very important. If a cell phone starts ringing during this event, I don't, I cannot be responsible for my actions. Okay. Um, uh, uh, there's also some material that I've been given to read in, about uh, possible disruptions, but there are not going to be any disruptions, so I'm not going to read it. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dalal Saib Araqat. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Tarek, uh, for this invitation. You are most welcome, but I'm not asking you to give a speech yet. No speech. So, okay. No speech. <laughs> okay. No speech. So can I can I just say before we before we get started, I you and I met about a year ago, uh, actually almost exactly a year ago in uh, Ramallah, and I have to say that Dr. Delal was one of uh, the people who in, who've I've met in the last five years who made uh, the most immediate and positive impression on me. We were at a lunch with uh, a academic and intellectual and civil society leaders in Ramallah, and Dr. Dalal really struck me as a very passionate advocate for freedom for Palestinians. And what, I, what struck me the most is that she was an advocate not just for the freedom of Palestinians from the, uh, the Israeli occupation, but also from uh, 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 authoritarian that has been imposed upon uh, Palestinians by those who ostensibly represent them. And Dr. Dalal can testify that I've been trying to get her here for quite a long time. And if you had told me in March of 2023 that uh, when uh, Dr. Dalal finally did come here, uh, it would be under a, a real cloud of accusations in the media about uh, 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 you know radicalism, about support for terrorism, that we would even be condemned by by a United States Senator for inviting you here. I, I, would, I would not have believed it uh, back then. And so uh, Dr. Delen and I have agreed that we would actually start this conversation by talking about the reason for those uh, accusations, which is some of the social media. But I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll not spend most of our time uh, on that. So uh, I just want to testify that we're doing this by mutual agreement, correct? Yes, I actually asked him to do so. Okay, okay. So should I, should I start? 
Yeah, but I have something to say before Go for it. Start. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just want to share that I'm absolutely eager to engage today, to discuss, to d debate, and also to learn from you guys. Um, I really believe that this is going to be an opportunity for us to hold a difficult yet a constructive conversation. And I want to share with the audience that as a professor inspired by um, Socrates, I always tell my students, I cannot teach you anything, and I don't want to teach you anything, but I really want you to think. And I come from Palestine today with the intention of not winning any arguments today, Tariq. I really want us to engage in a constructive, looking forward, solution-oriented debate and informative discourse that is very much needed everywhere, but especially at Harvard. You know, in universities as higher education institutions are expected to be the homes for knowledge production. So that's why today I'm hoping that Tariq and myself will be able to walk the talk of the motto of Harvard of Veritas, where our knowledge production for today will be based on truth and facts rather than mere opinions. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Zanal. Very, very much appreciated. Okay, so I'm going to pu pull up the 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 um, the first uh, tweet. So this is the tweet that was um, uh, uh, most often uh, cited, and this was uh, on October seventh. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the part of this tweet where you, you start by noting the great privation and pressure under which Gazans have been living uh, since 2005, uh, but then you say today is just a normal human struggle for freedom. And on October 7th, as we know, 1,200 Israelis killed, the vast majority of them civilians, women uh, subject to sexual assault, innocent partygoers slaughtered. How is that a normal human struggle for freedom? Thank you. Well, as I said, I'm not here to teach you anything, but maybe it's an obligation for academics, and it's an ethical and legal obligation to maybe try to educate a little bit on what international law is about and what UN General Assembly resolutions um, came with. And uh, I want to focus on the term today is a just normal human um, struggle for freedom. You know, uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 3314 of 1974 and UN Resolution 37 on 43 of 1982 implicitly, clearly spells out the rights of every people for struggle for freedom under occupation with all available means, including armed struggle. So in, in me portraying or reflecting on you and uh, General Assembly resolutions is by no means justifying any violence. It is, and I really urge you to look at the screen and see, it was 6.43 a.m. At that time on the 7th of October, six months from now, all we have seen our screens were fed with images of hundreds of Palestinian unarmed civilians who were running on bicycles, on motorcycles, paragliders, hundreds of civilians trying to break into the fence, seeking their freedom. So that was exactly what I was reflecting on. Until that um, timing, actually until the evening hours, nothing was reported on any casualties. No kidnapping, no nothing, nothing was reported on the other side. All we had been receiving was images of Palestinian young elderly children just fleeing into the, the, the border, the fence, to try to break the siege, to try to, to break the deadly blockage and siege that they have been suffering from for 17 years. And yes, I would like to cont contextualize here that we cannot neglect the fact that the Palestinian people have been suffering for 76 years now. Let's focus on Gaza for now. 16 years of deprivation of basic rights should not be tolerated by any of us. It is not okay that we have been learning that 2.3 million civilians, 50% of those are children. Can you imagine? A million children under the age of 18 living in Gaza being deprived of, you know, simple standards of education, mobility, hygiene, health system. And interestingly enough, I want to share a fact with you. You know, in the 21st century and 2024, um, internet services, Wi-Fi services, don't go under the line of human rights, but it's a human need. I mean, who of us can live without um, uh, Wi-Fi? In the best case scenario, 
the Gaza civilians can only enjoy 2G services. Not because they don't have the infrastructure, not because they don't have the human or natural resources that would provide for networks, etc., etc. But it was only because the Israeli military occupation authorities decided that they cannot enjoy um, internet. In the West Bank, the case is not much better. Mm. The best case scenario is 3G services. So here I'm just trying to show that this is not a periodic flare-up. This is a reflection of 76 years of apartheid, of Israeli military occupation, of settler colonialism, of confiscations of lands on daily basis that come for the, in the best interest of building more settlements on our grounds, of daily extrajudicial killings that we witness in every Palestinian city. And, I'm, and here we're talking about every Palestinian city, not only Gaza in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The daily arrests and detentions, and very recently, we are facing the danger and threat of settler terrorism. Yes, I call it settler terrorism. They are attacking us everywhere. We are no safe anywhere. So when the Palestinian people struggle for their freedom, this should, this should not provoke anybody. And this should not be interpreted as justifying violence against anybody. I hope I'm clear. Yeah, I, I really appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. Um, you know, you recommended that I read an article that you wrote in the uh, uh, Palestine, um, I think it was the, the uh, Journal of Palestine Studies, or at least the website of the Institute of Palestine Studies, called Gaza, the Caged Context. And so this was a week later, okay, October 13th. And you said, mm -hmm. quote, the events of the last few days mark a historic and natural human yearning for freedom. You described Hamas's taking of hostages, which, as you know, included women, children, and the, and the elderly, as coercive diplomacy. And you said, as you've just said now, that international law guarantees the right of people to defend themselves against aggression. And so that was the week after October 7th. And reading that article, it kind of does sound like you're saying October 7th was self-defense and it was therefore justified. What am I getting wrong in interpreting your article that way? Again, I reject the framing of October 7th, Israel-Hamas war, because we just cannot negate the fact that this settler colonial project started 76 years ago. Um, when it comes to coercive diplomacy, I'm a professor of diplomacy. So coercive diplomacy is a science, it's a field of, of studies. If you look at any hostage exchange deals in our recent history, even including the ones with the Islamic movements, Hezbollah, etc., etc., it was always referred to as coercive diplomacy. And you know, hostages are usually taken. This is against international humanitarian law. I am aware of that, and I did mm -hmm. reflect on that, that Article 49 of the Four Geneva Convention, sorry, not 49, but it, it specifies that taking hostages is prohibited in international humanitarian law. However, this is a tactic that's been used throughout history, and it has been used as a, as a tactic in coercive diplomacy and putting more pressure in the negotiations. It's a tactic that's been used throughout history. Like, that doesn't make it... That that certainly can't be the, the the argument for why it's permissible, right? Of course not. I did not justify it in any any way, Tariq. And it's, I'm not saying it's permissible. I'm just saying from um, an academic perspective, right. if you want to apply theory to practice, I think it's wise to try to see how different um, negotiating parties would use hostages in the negotiations processes. Even the Israelis, they have been using it against us ever since the peace process had started. Yeah. Even, even the, the prisoners who were taken uh, even before the Oslo uh, occurs, up until this moment, and they're still held behind Israeli bars. Israel did not release them in, in, in respect to their obligations under the peace process that was signed. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could, you could, you, you know, you have uh, actually clearly stated that the taking of hostages is against international law. It also doesn't seem to have worked. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I want to come back to uh, uh, something that you said about the, the deprivation in Gaza, which is actually quite horrific. If people are not familiar with what is happening in Gaza, I urge you, before October 7th, I urge you to familiarize yourself with it. Ga Gazans were really living 
uh, they were trying to make the best of a very bad situation. And though there are photographs of, you know, oh, there's they had malls or people, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, there were there are sites of children's parks, etc. That doesn't mean that this was not a terrible situation. I guess part of the question, though, is whose fault is it? And what I don't understand is why Hamas does not bear more culpability in your view, not just for what is happening now, which they, I think you could make a very strong argument that they brought on the people of Gaza, but ever since 2005, the way that Hamas has governed Gaza, they, I, I'm not going to say, as some people say, they could have turned it into a Singapore, that's not possible, but they could have turned it into something more than a staging ground for periodic rockets attacks against Israel, no. So what, where is Hamas's culpability in all this, and why, 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 do, why is Hamas in, in your framework viewed as a legitimate entity representing the Palestinian people, engaging in coercive diplomacy, engaging in self-defense? I think of this as a group that's taken the Palestinians, at least the people in Gaza, as hostage for the last 17 years. Well, I think Hamas is the fig leaf that the Israeli right-wing government is using which Netanyahu had empowered over the years. Well, some people are under the impression that in 2005, the Israelis withdrew from Gaza and that they granted freedom to Gaza. Allow me to correct, mm. uh, you know, what happened. They did actually dismantle the settlements in Gaza in 2005. And around 6,000 to 9,000 settlers were withdrawn from, from Gaza then. But it was Sharon's aide, Dove vice class then, who said it himself. He said, this is formal dahaid. This is just to hinder any political horizon between Gaza and the West Bank. Later, Netanyahu also, until recently, kept saying that I am the only one capable of hindering any two-state solution, yeah. and that he is the only one capable of the divide and rule between Gaza and the West Bank. So what I'm trying to tell you is that while some people are under the impression because of the biased Western media collaboration with the Israeli Hasbara machines, which were, which were, which tried to mislead the audiences for so long and put them under the impression that yes, Hamas is taking, is in control of Gaza. Mm. Let me tell you, until the 6th of October, nobody, nothing could go in or out of Gaza without an Israeli permission. They did withdraw the settlers, mm -hmm. but never, not for one single day, had they seized their control over the borders, whether by, by land, by sea, or by air over Gaza. You could ask anybody, even consul generals, ambassadors, uh, whoever, if you wanted to visit Gaza before six, October 6th, you need a permission from the Israeli authorities and not from Hamas. Am I clear? Yeah. Hamas won the elections. Hamas did a coup d'etat. I'm not saying, I'm not uh, negating those facts. Yes, they're not, maybe they're not the best in administ public administration, but the fact that we are under the impression that Gaza is free and 2.3 million Palestinians were free under the Hamas rule, this is something that I must bluntly reject. Yeah. This is not an Israel-Hamas war that we are witnessing. You know, I live in Ramallah. I'm just coming from Palestine. For the past six months alone, more than 420 Palestinian civilians have been murdered in the West Bank. On a daily basis, we have incursions and invasions of Israeli military troops coming into every Palestinian city in Gaza and, and uh, refugee camp. In Nablus, in Kalkilia, in Tulkarim, in Jenin, in Ramallah, in Jericho, in Hebron, in Bethlehem, even in East Jerusalem. Every Palestinian is target to the Israeli military machine, no matter where you are. This is a war against truth, and this is a war against the Palestinian right to self-determination. What we are witnessing on the ground is a translation. It's a practical translation of a settler colonial project that has been going for decades. And allow me to share with you from an academic perspective, from a well-read background, that this is all inspired by the Balfour Declaration, which referred to the non-Jewish communities living there as minorities. Tell, you have to tell everybody what the Balfour Declaration was. As I said, I'm not here to teach them things, no. but I want them to think, but I want yeah. them to go and research. And I'm sure I, I, I no, want to provoke their curiosity as well. World but War I era. Can, yeah. What I want you maybe... So, sorry, can I just tell everybody what Balfour was? World War I era promise by the British to uh, the Jewish community to allow them to establish a homeland in uh, 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 
uh, present-day Israel. Yes, go on. Yeah, but the second paragraph in the Balfour Declaration literally said that the non-Jewish communities can only enjoy religious and civil rights, but never political rights. This means looking at the Palestinians, who were actually the majority then, as minorities who can never enjoy the right to self-determination. Yeah. This is exactly what we are say seeing today. Netanyahu is using Hamas as a fig leaf. And yes, it's a very nice, easy selling card to the Western minds and audience, yeah. even for somebody like me. If you come and tell me, you know, look, Hamas, 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 it is easy to link Hamas to terror, to ISIS, to Daesh, to Iran. It is the fig leaf that, ha that Netanyahu had been empowering. And it, it's not a secret. Netanyahu had been allowing the cash money to go to Hamas via Ben Gurion airport. Yeah. I, I wonder if, 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 if Netanyahu did not allow cash to go to Hamas to pay salaries, etc., would you have said good job? Would you have said, great, thank you for starving Hamas of resources? No. Or would you have said, you know, you're starving Palestinian civil servants in Gaza of their salaries? No, I came here to engage in a constructive, difficult I know, conversation. I'm asking, I'm asking. You because Dr. Dr. Delal, Dr. Delal, Dr. Delal, but it just seems like, uh, so first of all, um, again, with we should get into the 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 particularly some of the more extreme crimes that settlers in the West Bank are, and there's a very good story in The New Yorker this week about it. But, but I just wanna, I wanna just talk about, or get, get kind of clarity on how you see uh, October 7th and, and its aftermath, and the, particularly the problem now. And I guess what I'm feeling in your comment is a, a, a lack of an interest or willingness to take on some agency. You know, that in your view, it seems Hamas, the Palestinians, constantly the victim. There's nothing that we could have done. Yes, you're right. The Israelis control what goes in and out of uh, Gaza. But Hamas controls what people do with the things that come in and out of Gaza. Why did they build tunnels and rockets as opposed to? Right now, 30,000 Palestinians have been killed in what I think is a very inhumane bombing campaign, okay? I think it's, you could even go further and say there are war crimes being committed right now. Hamas could stop it right now by releasing hostages. It doesn't. And I don't hear you saying Hamas stop, uh, uh, re release the hostages. Uh, it, when, you talk about the settler, when, when you talk about the settler violence, you know, you read any story about settler violence and read any story about the noble Palestinian resistance to settler violence, and you'll always find accounts of five or six Israeli activists were, are with the Palestinians standing against the settler violence. You are a liberal, highly educated, you know, and I know you to be a very peace-loving person, but you're not willing to assign culpability to, or at least some of the culpability for this situation to Hamas. I said in so many media appearances, and I urged Hamas in so many media appearances, and I'm not shy to share here too, that they need to release the civilian hostages who are kept in Gaza. This is be not because I, 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 I have a say on Hamas or anything, this is because I respect international law. And as I just said, it is clear in the four Geneva Conventions. However, I'm not here to speak on behalf of Hamas, Ya Tariq. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to speak on behalf of my people, the Palestinians, our struggle, our rights. And I am here as a professor of conflict resolution who is very passionate and dedicated to bring about change in our societies mm -hmm. to a, a more looking forward, better, sustainable, strategic, yes. peaceful yes. Um, timings for our people and for my children and, and, and others, whether for the Israelis or the Palestinians. But to keep putting the to play the blame game mm. i really don't find it wise now as thousands of souls are perishing mm. as israel is still murdering and massacring and shelling anything that is civilian in gaza they targeted all universities can you imagine they did not leave infrastructure for any education let alone schools nurseries medical services uh, clinics uh, homes residential buildings nothing is left to be human in Gaza. And I want here to touch upon some international reports that used to come years, years before October 7th that Gaza was, you know, identified as not very humane place in the 21st century. So can you imagine now it's turned into rubbles? You know, people are still under the rubble. The number is 30,000 Palestinian souls. My own son, who's 15 years old, told me last month, Mama, the lesson I learned in the past 
uh, months is that our lives are not equal to those of our peers living whether in Tel Aviv or Paris or, or New York or Shanghai. Is this the lesson that we want our children to learn today? No, I'm talking about the humanity, Tariq. When I say justice, I say justice for all. When I say never again, I say never again for all. We should not justify violence for anybody. No rape against anybody. No kidnapping against anybody. But while 8,000 Palestinian prisoners are behind Israeli jails, yeah. we, could, we should not also tolerate that Israel continues to commit all different war crimes against the Palestinian people while enjoying every impunity possible. And when we dare to speak, when we dare to be vocal, when we dare to criticize the Israeli right-wing government, when we dare to speak against the Israeli military occupation that is abnormal in the 21st century, we automatically get labeled as being anti-Semitic. Yeah. Well, okay, so c there's a cu couple of threads to, to pull on here. You know, what would you res how would you respond to somebody who says, look, Dr. Dalal, I don't understand how you want Israel to respond to what happened on October 7th. Doesn't Israel have some right to uh, go after Hamas, which perpetrated these crimes? If you grant that Israel has the right to do that, well, the fact of the matter is that Hamas hides among civilians in Gaza. And so it's not possible to go after uh, Hamas without incurring civilian casualties. How do you respond to that argument? So um, Article 51 of the UN Charter and Article 31 of the Rome Statute tells it clearly that everybody had the right to defend themselves. However, if we want to take it from a legal perspective and interpret the articles according to what we're witnessing on the ground, Israel, as the occupying state, cannot claim that it is defending itself against a community that it occupies. I'm speaking law now. Mm -hmm. However, I am very empathetic. And I took this negotiations course at Harvard where Dan Shapiro, who is with, with us here, uh, wrote about emotions and negotiations. And I learned about empathy. I learned about empathy. And I'm very proud to say that I am an empathetic person. And I could, I can empathize with the Israelis with the shock that they had been going through on October 7. October 7 started and ended for the Israelis on October 7. But on the Palestinian side, it's still ongoing, up until this moment. Every hour, two Palestinian mothers die. You know, tomorrow we celebrate International Women's Day. So we want to be empathetic, and we want to understand the perspectives and where everybody comes from. And we want to understand that it's not only Israel that can claim to have the right to self-defense. Also, the Palestinians have the right to resist, as I said, the right to struggle for freedom under occupation, the right to defend themselves. Yeah. The shock doctrine that the Israel is practicing had been going for so long. I think they need wisdom at this moment. And I'm not saying that they, they, they should not, you know, uh, hold Hamas accountable, for example. Mm -hmm. But I'm a professor who claims to be civilized. So I want to remind you here that there are legal international tools that can hold Israel and Hamas accountable. Why don't we resort to the ICC to hold accountable every person who took part in those um, crimes. Why don't we resort to the ICJ, which is the International Court for Justice, to take care of those people? It is not my job as Dalal Ariqat or Netanyahu as the Prime Minister of Israel to hold people accountable. There are some legal tools. If we are diplomatic, if we are legal, if we are civilized as we claim, then resorting to international legal tools should not be offending to anybody. You know, I, 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 on an abstract level, you know, a, a part of me understands what you're saying, but, you know, the other, it, it just seems, A, incredibly unrealistic to assume that the state of Israel would not respond militarily to this attack, which even you admit was I extremely horrific. There's also a little bit of an asymmetry in the way you talk about this. It's like when Hamas takes women and children hostages, it's coercive diplomacy. When Israel responds to uh, it militarily, it's suddenly a violation of all kinds of... And so, you know, you talked about e empathy. So this is another 
tweet that we agreed we would <laughs> we would talk we would talk about. So this was the next day where you said we'll never forgive the Israeli right wing extreme government for making us take their children and elderly as hostages. And so what 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 was that tweet about? Thank you. Well, before we go into the explanation, yeah, um, I want to admit that. Lacking any context or any rigorous analysis, I admit that this could be interpreted in a controversial way. However, again, I was inspired by a famous lady who's called Golda Meir. <laughs> and going back to empathy. Golda Meir, the former Israeli prime minister. Yes. Okay. Again, I assume that the people are knowledgeable here. Well, it's going to be on YouTube. and. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Yes, being inspired by the words that she said about the Arabs and the Palestinians. Can you imagine how her words had Wait, fallen on say? our ears? Yeah. I, I actually talked about um, uh, taking hostages. Yeah. She talked about killing the Wait, Palestinians. Wait, what's the Golda Meir quote? Just say it, because I don't think people know it. She said, we will never for forgive the... The Arabs. She said we might making us yeah. kill their children. Yeah, she said we might forgive the Arabs for killing our children, but we will never forgive them for making us kill, kill their, their children. children. Yes. Yeah. So I said we will never forgive the Israeli right wing government for making us take their elderly as hostages. So the nuanced language that I, I use is a way much you know more diplomatic and civilized and less provoking than her, her words. I use the word kidnapping and not killing. Yeah. Yet. Going back to empathy, going back to, um, you know, treating each other on equal basis. Yes, the words are provoking. But can you imagine how provocative her words were to me as a Palestinian for the past decades? She's not a professor of conflict resolution. Oh, when I become the prime minister of Palestine, I promise you, you won't me, you won't hear me say such things. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but but I mean, what was the what what what? Who's us here? You know, that's the, the Palestinians. It's, it's simple. Let's not. Let's but Hamas it. is Hamas the representative of the Palestinians? When October seventh happened, was it Hamas doing it or was it the Palestinians doing it? Because I've been telling people it wasn't the Palestinians; it was Hamas. And then you're tweeting this, and you're saying, "No, it was us." Listen, he is again trying to spin everything around Hamas, and that is something that I again reject, Tariq. Yeah, yeah. This is an Israeli-Palestinian thing. This is not against Hamas. I'm not a fan of Hamas. Let's not allude to, to really things that are not constructive yeah. in, this, in this conversation. Hamas did the attack. However, I'm speaking about the Palestinian people. We have a right. We've been suffering from the Israeli military occupation for so long. And it should not be tolerated that this military occupation continues to cause us injustices in 2024. Yeah. While everybody knows and the war crimes are, are documented on the screens, nobody should remain silent. We don't have a ceasefire until this moment. While children in Gaza, not only, you know, 14,000 children have, have perished. 17,000 had lost their parents, let alone the tens of thousands who are amputated, who lost their limbs. So what kind of future? Really, what kind of, if we are talking about a conflict resolution, a future, a peaceful uh, days ahead, what kind of mentality are we expecting from those children when they grow up in 15 years' time? Mm -hmm. To be forgiving? To be empathetic? Mm -hmm. Violence can only breed violence. Mm -hmm. But let me also add that violence of the weak is called terror and violence of the strong is referred to as war against terror, unfortunately. When violence is rewarded, things can only get worse. And that's why we are here at this moment in the Middle East now. Yeah. Um, it's the Israeli military occupation that I blame for the existing atrocities that we are suffering. Yeah. So, so I mean, you you you've you've made it clear that in your view, the atrocities are uh, a, a result of the occupation. What what I'm trying to understand, if you think, is if you think that it was legitimate resistance, or if you're if you're trying to justify it, or if you're trying to just explain it. Listen, you're speaking to a mother. I have three children, yeah. to a woman who is pri very proud of her um, feminist yeah. identity, yeah. and to a professor of diplomacy, Tarek. Yes, this is a very diplomatic tweet. But I can never justify violence. Yeah. I can never justify violence no, against no matter who, no matter when. Yeah. But 
I'm also obliged to remind you that Hamas was created in the late 80s. The Israeli occupation started way before. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so, so the last thing we agreed we would talk about is this other, uh, I think this was an Instagram post that was on... Um, uh, uh, a response to Cheryl response. Sandberg. And what I did is, so this is how it looks online, but what I've done is I've, I've just uh, made the presentation a little bit easier for people to read. So what's happening here? <gasps> well, I want your attention, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I assume you all know Cheryl Sandberg. She... I've never... Who is that? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> so I think it was important to put her uh, post to see how I reacted. I, I couldn't find it. I just could find on your... your po I, I don't okay, know. Anyway, it, she yeah. was the one who actually led the campaigns from the U.S. Um, uh, in plight and in defense of uh, women's rights on the Israeli side. Mm -hmm. So what I said that... Yes, we're all 100% as women against rape and against violence by, by all means, against humanity. But I also tried to remind her, because I am one of her circles, of the Lenin circles, as the Lal Ariqat for more than 16 years now. Mm. I have never, ever heard her voice when it came to the suffering and the injustices of the Palestinian woman, for example. Mm. And here, let me tell you, it's not only rape, and there are documented, of course, um, international uh, UN reports on rape against Palestinian women from the Israeli military occupation. But there is also 40 Palestinian women are now behind Israeli bars. There are... 55,000 Palestinian pregnant women in Gaza right now. 55,000 Palestinian women pregnant deprived of the basic, you know, visits to doctors, ecosystem to check on the baby, the hygiene environment, let alone the ceiling to give birth under. Yeah. So I was really outraged and provoked by Cheryl Sandberg, who spoke up that loudly, mm. but never came to speak on behalf of the other women who are, who are suffering on daily basis. You know, Palestinian women suffering is not only sexual. It's also, you know, when, when we stand against violence against women, it has so many layers. Can I tell you, as a mother myself, who is considered to be a very privileged Palestinian, I'm a professor, I'm young, I, I travel, I teach, I'm, you know, mm. I'm from the middle class, if I may say, however, as a woman, as a mother, if I want to plan a visit for my kids to go and visit their grandma over the weekend, I have to pass at least two checkpoints from Ramallah to Jericho, which is 40 minutes away. On the checkpoints, my three kids sitting in the back seat will have to face the Israeli soldiers pointing the guns at their faces while they check my ID and check the trunk and interrogate me and ask me different questions. This is not normal. And I really want the world to speak that this is not normal for Palestinian women, let alone the detention, the arbitrary detention. You know that Israel is the one and only country in the world that practices administrative detention, which is basically they can detain, they can arrest, they can keep in custody without trials. Every six months they renew it. Have you ever been to uh, Egypt? And it's happened. No, but I mean... <laughs> Listen, we're talking about the democracy of the Middle East, Tarek. Yes, yes, yes. Please. Fair, fair. Please. Huh? Fair. So, 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 sorry. Please, we're, there will be time for questions afterwards. Please. No, but speaking yeah. about women, I also want to tell you and share with you that there are more than 140 Palestinian women today who are waiting yeah. for the bodies of their sons and daughters yeah. to be retrieved from Israeli refrigerators. Those are the bodies of the martyrs of the Palestinians who are kept in the laps of Tel Aviv University. Can you imagine? You know, the credibility, yeah. please, Tarek, they need to know those facts in case they don't know them. They enjoy amazing reputation, the Israeli um, universities. And my cousin is one of those uh, bodies, by the way. So my auntie, my uncle's wife, is suffering until this moment. All she asks for now, Three years later, my cousin was murdered in June 2020 on his sister's wedding day. He was 26 years old, in a love affair, an athlete. He had a small business, nothing related to Hamas, very liberal. They decided to terminate his life with six bullets in three seconds.
Just because they thought he paused danger on the checkpoint. Listen, I wanted to take it, no, I want to say more. Even if he really, I want to say, the, the, to, to go into that scenario, if he really paused that threat, two bullets in his legs would have been enough but not to terminate his, his life. However, the sad story doesn't end here. The sad story is that my uncle and his wife today don't want to hold the criminals accountable. This is not what they're asking today. All they ask is to bury their son with dignity and to bid farewell. This should not be tolerated in 2024. Yeah. Let no. alone that he's innocent, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, uh, you're, you're not going to get any argument from me about the injustices of the occupation. Uh, uh, a, a defender uh, of Israel's conduct in the occupation might say, look, these things aren't happening because Israelis just hate Palestinians. They're happening because there is violence uh, that, uh, and there is terror that uh, 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 Palestinians perpetrate. It, it, see October 7th. And so there is this kind of endless cycle uh, that, you know, we could uh, go on and on about. The question is, how do we get out of it? But I just want to, before we, and I want to spend time on that, just very quickly on this one. You are not saying the rapes didn't happen in, in, this, in this tweet. Who am I to say so? Yeah, yeah. Investigations, you know, legal tools can investigate, yeah. do rigorous investigations, and then decide. Yeah. There's None a, of us is actually, you know, entitled to, to just, just to claim things yeah. or, you know, mislead the audiences or use propaganda just to make things um, seem horrific or to export ugly scenes. I mean, because the UN has said that there was, there is credible evidence of, yeah. I don't say no. Sub, can I ask one last question just before you, the last, you've said this word before and you just said it uh, earlier today. This, 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 you say don't fall into Hasbara. What is that? <laughs> this is um, the Israeli media machine that is very well invested. Yeah. And that is actually administered um, by the prime minister's office himself. And it's very well um, connected to all the different offices at the ministerial levels. They, and you know, I applaud them actually for this machine because for decades they have been- What, well, so propaganda you mean? You can call it propaganda in, in, in English. <laughs> why, why do you use the word, why don't you just call it propaganda? Like, why do you use the word Hasbara? Because it's a terminology that exists on the Israeli media machinery. You know, I, it's, you know, I, I think, you know, if you just think about, you know, Dalad Saab Arqat accusing the Israelis of engaging in propaganda versus uh, accusing them of engaging in Hasbara. Like, you know, I, I think of, uh, you know, when, Muslim politicians are criticized in this country by, you know, for lack of a better word, Islamophobes, people who don't like Muslims. And they'll say, oh, they're, if, if a Muslim politician is lying, they'll say, oh, that guy is engaging in taqiyya, as if there's like a, a special Muslim kind of lying. And I feel like, and, and I experienced that, I would much rather you say that the guy's lying. It doesn't feel Islamophobic when you say the guy's lying. Why, why do you use that special term? Why do you just say they're engaging in propaganda? Listen, I'm not saying that they're lying, but I'm saying that they are trying to spread uh, opinions and um, meritless opinions yeah, yeah. without any facts, without any documented resources. That's, yeah. that's the only thing I, I am talking about. Yeah. And they have been successful, very successful. Yeah. We have been portrayed as Palestinians as being um, the terrorists, as the, the ones who are causing the, the violence. While we all know that for more than seven decades we have been suffering and the war crimes have been documented and still yeah. Israel is enjoying every impunity possible. Yeah. When they murdered Shireen Abu Aqleh, yeah. she's not Muslim. She's Christian, she's American, she's a fine journalist, very professional. When they murdered my own cousin, yeah. when they uh, decided to label six human rights organizations as terrorists, yeah. they come up with a certain narrative yeah. and they spread it around with the help of the biased Western media. Allow me to say so without any documented truth, without any facts. And they manage to mislead the audiences. It's about time we stop this war against truth. It's about time we, and I urge you always, even for things that I just said, don't call me a liar, but go, do your investigation, do your research after what I had shared with you today. And then allow yourself to judge. You don't need to take my opinion, as I said, we're not here to teach you what to think, but we're here to urge you and provoke your thinking. You know, Dr. Dalel, I mean, one thing that I've, you know, you, you noted about uh, Sheryl Sandberg and why Sheryl Sandberg's 
um, I guess, Instagram post was so wounding to you as somebody who'd been a member of her group is that it, la- it seemed to lack empathy with uh, the, 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 the suffering of the Palestinians. And I kind of want to zoom out from the conversation about tweets and just get your take as a scholar of conflict resolution. When I... Um, uh, a first, the first image of October 7th that I saw was of the Hamas fighters uh, driving around with the, the body of that uh, poor woman whose name I'm, um, I, I'm forgetting. Um, Shani, yes. Shani Luke or was it Abu um, Abdu, Abdush? Okay, sorry. There were two then women who were subject to something. But this is the, the, dead, the dead body of the dead body that I'm referring to. And the... Um, the the almost joy or glee that ordinary citizens seem to be greeting these Hamas fighters who had with them the palpable evidence of an atrocity. And then I saw the other image that gives me great uh, um, sadness is image of Israelis lining up deck chairs to watch and applaud uh, the bombing of Gaza as if it's some kind of movie. And both of those scenes speak to me of a very deep lack of empathy on the part of these two people who from this day till the day of judgment are going to be living together. And so I guess the question I want to ask you is, as a scholar of conflict resolution, as a scholar, you know, how do we get out of this? I mean, shouldn't, doesn't it have to start with empathy with the other side? And I'm not going to, I'm not going to then say to you, and therefore, shouldn't you be more empathetic? I'm not going there, but how do we establish empathy? I think we we really need um, responsible leadership, responsible leaders. Okay. Who Let's should just stop the atrocities that are going? Who should just do an, an immediate ceasefire? Because you you just argued, for example, yeah. that if Hamas releases the hostages, then everything will be over. In fact. In fact, and I hate to speak on behalf of Hamas. I'm not here to speak on behalf of Hamas. Hamas had been saying. Ever since the first weeks of the negotiations, complete ceasefire for the release of the hostages. The Israelis. They should get everything they want? Listen, Tarek. It is about, you know, being. It's about common sense. So if it's okay for you to have a permanently ceasefire for the Israeli troops to relax for a week or two and then they can continue to murdering and shelling the Palestinian civilians, this should also be not okay. Why aren't you calling on Hamas to surrender? Give up the hostages and surrender. Get out of the country. And then? And then we'll, then we should talk about and then, but... I would love to talk so, about that so and is then. It your, is it your stipulation that if Hamas today said, here are all the hostages and we're leaving, we're going to... Do you really believe that, seriously speaking, now I'm, I'm addressing your brains now, please. Do you really compare the military might of Hamas to the Israeli military might? No, do you really see that I'm, there you, is really equal combatants on the ground? Do you really think that wouldn't end everything right now if Hamas no, said no, no. unconditional I tell you why. I tell you why. I tell you why. For the past 30 years, for the past 30 years, the Middle East has been going under the what is so-called the peace process. The PLO had recognized the Israeli state so many times. They had given up on 78% of mandated Palestine. This map. Just to show that the PLO and the Palestinians really want a better and more peaceful, sustainable, strategic future for the Palestinians and the Israelis alike in the Middle East. We believed in dialogue, in diplomacy, in negotiations. Our leaders promised us dignity, freedom, statehood, independence. 30 years later, all we witnessed is a more entrenched Israeli military occupation and more settler colonialism. Well, I mean, the Israeli would say... Netanyahu, no, hold on. Why do you want me and yourself to trust Netanyahu, who is still repeating yeah. at every opportunity possible that he is against peace, he is against the two-state solution, and he said bluntly yes to annexation and settlements. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. I, if I could get... peace. We want the two-state solution, but this should be put... Um, on the lab of but, Netanyahu. But, and no, the uh, 100%. But you are making it seem as if the last, you know, uh, several decades have been ones in which the Israelis have only uh, uh, entrenched their occupation. You're not talking about the peace deals that were offered that were rejected, you know. 
there could have been a Palestinian state. Listen, I did a research on Camp David. Yeah. I interviewed all of the Israeli negotiators, Palestinian negotiators, and the American negotiators. Yeah, yeah. And my um, research is published now. It's under the theory of coercive diplomacy again. Mm. It's, the Palestinians have always been coerced to the maximum, you know, to serve the best interest of, of the, the Israelis. There was no written proposal at Camp David, guys. Mm -hmm. Please go read my research. Go speak to the negotiators who are still alive. Yeah. You know who agrees with you on that is actually Jared, Jared Kushner, who said the same thing in his book. Um, you know. The deal maker who has the nothing to do with states. So, so, so um, you know, I, I want to I make sure that we have time to get to questions, but I guess what I... Did I what put I, up the, the photo of the woman? Oh, so you want... Yes, you had a photo that you wanted me to show. Do you... Yes. Can I ask one question, then we can show the photo, and then you can tell... So, you know, you talked about all... Graphic, sure. Yeah. You talked about all of the negotiators that you interviewed for your paper. I'm assuming that one of them was, uh, if you permit me to mention, your uh, late father, uh, Sa'ib Araqat, who was, in case people don't know, a, a, a senior Palestinian uh, negotiator. He was he is often referred to as the Oslo, uh, the architect of the Oslo Accords. He was a senior fellow here at the Belfer Center uh, with uh, Nick Burns uh, back in uh, 2020 before his uh, untimely uh, passing. And so, you know, I, I think if I, you know, I, I'm very thrilled to be sitting with the daughter of Sa'ib Araqat, who's a scholar in her own right. But if I were sitting with uh, Sa'ib Araqat, the architect of Oslo, I might ask him, how would you architect us out of this? How can we make a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians where the Palestinians can achieve their right of self-determination and the Israelis can be assured that October 7th won't happen again? And how would you answer that question? Some might find Tariq's question unprofessional. Yet, I'm very, very proud of being the daughter of Saeb Erekat. My dad has devoted all his life to the path of diplomacy, negotiations, um, and peace talks. He promised me and my generation that he would bring us statehood, independence, sovereignty, Dignity, freedom. Yes, he was the chief Palestinian negotiator for so long. But sadly enough, my father had to leave the earth without realizing his dreams, mm. without delivering to me what he promised me. This is the sad reality that I want the peers of my father, the ones who are still negotiating on the Israeli side and on the American side and on the Palestinian side, to not just leave the world without realizing that dream for our kids and our generations. However, you just mentioned the, the, the word, the architect of Oslo. Mm -hmm. I need to correct um, that fact. One, one of the architects. No, 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 let me, I'm um, just, there is a, uh, there is big confusion. That's why I think I owe you this um, explanation. Um, uh, when the Palestinian negotiators went to Madrid in 1991, there was a Palestine um, insiders delegation when I say insiders, I mean the Palestinians residing inside Palestine. So then the PLO has designated um, Haider Abdel Shafi from Gaza, who was the chief of the delegation, and um, Saeb Arikat, who was an academic at the Najah University in Nablus, and Hanan Ashrawi, who was an academic at Birzeit University, and Faisal Al Husseini from Jerusalem. So those four were the Palestinian insider delegation who were supposed to be the official Palestinian delegation negotiating on behalf of the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. When the Oslo talks happened and when they started, you know, being leaked in the news, those four insider negotiations had no clue about the secret track mm -hmm. that was taking place in Oslo. Mm -hmm. I asked my own father. Mm -hmm. I told him, how did you feel mm -hmm. as, you know, being designated at the official Palestinian negotiating on behalf of the Palestinian people while you had no idea about a, a back channel that was, you know, being conducted for, all the, for that long without you knowing. And he did not shy to share with me. He said, listen, it was very disappointing at that moment. It was a shocking moment to all of us as the Palestinian negotiators. Yet, he told me, before judging, 
I asked the PLO um, uh, architect, who's actually Mahmoud Abbas, our current mm. president, mm. Uh, Abu Mazen. He is the one who negotiated uh, Oslo mm. and not the Palestinian insider delegation. I think this is a fact that needs to be documented for the generations who are dealing with negotiations. But I want to also share with you that he told me as I looked at the document on the first page, and when I saw that the Israeli government recognizing the PLO, for him, as he told me, that was a big, big achievement. Because then, the PLO was considered, like Hamas today, a terrorist organization. Yeah. So for him, that was a big, big um, uh, victory on the negotiating side. However, he had shared with me that the most difficult setback that he found in the document was the lack of mention on settlements. Because yeah. he knew that it is a settler colonial project, because he knew that settlements stand as the main obstacle to any peaceful resolution in the future. Yeah. However, Hader Abdel Shafi, uh, at that time, he resigned mm -hmm. because he wanted to protest the fact that he didn't know there was a back channel. Saab Arikat Hanan Ashrawi and Faisal Husseini thought, no, the Palestinian cause need them, that the negotiations need them, and that they would continue to serve the best interests of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause, hoping to bring um, amendments yeah. to the future drafts. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I'm very glad for that historical corrective because I have to say, I have always felt that the component of Oslo that resulted in leadership of the Palestinians being put in the hands of the PLO and of Yasser Arafat was a great setback. When I, when I was a kid, I I remember in Saudi Arabia, the first time I, I, I saw um, um, Abba Iban, who was the Israeli, uh, had been the Israeli foreign minister. And he speaks in the Queen's English. He looks like more of a Harvard professor than I do, certainly. And I remember thinking as a young, you know, Arab who wanted, you know, Palestinian freedom, I felt, I remember feeling so depressed. I was like, look at who the Israelis have. The Israelis have Abba Iban. That guy is a formidable intellect. What, what do we have? We have Yasser Arafat. And then, when I saw your father, when I saw Hanan Ashrawi, Faisal Husseini, Haider Abdel Shafi, I thought at, at, at Madrid negotiating on behalf of the Palestinians, university professors, physicians, I thought, okay, that's, that's the leadership of the Palestinians. That's the Palestinians' uh, Abba Iban. And I've, I've asked Hanan Ashrawi this question. You can find it on YouTube. Why did you guys so willingly a uh, uh, surrender leadership of 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 this to to the PLO. I felt like Oslo was the Americans and the Israelis saying to the Palestinians, "Here's your Arab dictator. Now be governed like every other Arab dictatorship." And one of the reasons I liked you and still do, is because when I met you in Ramallah, you really did seem to be saying that this is a big part of the problem that Palestinians have, that the Palestinians do not have the legitimate democratic leadership that can effectively represent them. And, you know, I felt that you were somebody who was starting from taking agency that in, to first to end the occupation, we must first end the authoritarianism. And then we'll be able to have representatives of the Palestinian people who can s sit across the table from the Israelis and credibly say, I'm not just some Qatari or Iranian-funded terrorist group, or I'm not some uh, client of uh, the Americans and the Israelis that's being held afloat by them, i.e. Uh, Fatah, but rather I'm the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Am I wrong in thinking that's, that's got to be the first step? You keep saying the first step is better leadership on the Israeli side. Isn't it better, more democratically legitimate leadership on the Palestinian side? The first step is ending the Israeli military occupation. It's not about just leadership. It's about an international will, international community. Everybody who advocates for a two-state solution should be calling for the end of the Israeli military occupation, should be asking to define the border of the state of Israel, yeah. should be recognizing the Palestinian state. Yeah. Leadership is also a necessity. However, I do realize as a Palestinian that we have a lot of internal setbacks. Yes, we deserve better, we need democracy, we need elections, and we need a better leadership that is reflective of the capacities and the capabilities of the Palestinian youth, the Palestinian women, the Palestinian know-how. Mm -hmm. We have really much better, we could look much more attractive and much more appealing to normalization deals with the Palestinians rather with the, with the Israelis in the soon future. However, just because you stomached of Arafat, um, can I just say one thing? When we um, study history, yeah, that for a freedom fighter, 
to convert and shift his strategy from being a freedom fighter to being a negotiator and a peacemaker, we should all be applauding Yasser Arafat well, for that. Self-interest. We should all be applauding him for that. It why was why do you say self-interest? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? The Israeli uh, decision makers are still choosing rockets and missiles and fire and war crimes, and they're still shelling the Palestinian civilians and children in Gaza. They did not choose yeah. to go for peaceful resolution. Yeah. They're still saying that we have all the right to defend ourselves. Yeah. Defend yourselves while justifying the killings and the murders. Guys, this is not the Dalal Araqat speaking about a genocidal acts in Gaza. It's the ICJ that rules for plausibility of Israel in committing genocide in 2024. Yeah. You know, I'm a professor, and a comparative approach of learning is really important to be adopted nowadays. The Holocaust has been taught, and we have learned the Holocaust as being the crime of the crimes against the humanity in the 20th century. Yeah. We should learn from it. We should say never again to all humanity, whether for, for any religion, any color, any ideology, including those in Gaza, it should not be tolerated. It should not be okay. You know, all the legal tools that, are, that, that were created were created just after the Holocaust to make sure that we say never again, yeah. that we stop violence, we stop bloodshed. So, I mean, obviously somebody could, uh, and, and you almost certainly will in the Q&A here, people take issue with that e equation of Israel's response to October 7th and the That's Holocaust. I mean, but, but um, you had asked me to show uh, yeah. a slide. So let me pull it up and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So, who are this these is me lines? in the middle. Yeah. And gathered with me is are around 80 Palestinian women in Gaza. This picture was taken on the 19th of September, 2023, less than three weeks before October 7th. This is the kickoff meeting for what was supposed to be tomorrow, the Palestinian Women's Summit taking place in Palestine. You know what is really sad? Is that I'm sure the majority of you don't know that there are Palestinian beautiful women in Gaza who hold businesses and startups and uh, are academics and engineers and writers and some of them are artists and dancers and singers. But the sad story for me is that because I am the founding president of the Palestine uh, Business and Professional Women Network, and this was an effort to bring together the Palestinian women from Gaza and, and the West Bank together in this summit. Most of those women have been massacred let alone the businesses, the infrastructure, the homes, the families that they had lost. So again, what I'm trying to share with you today, as much as I want to be academic and civilized and human and woman, speaking of all the different rights for the civilization and for humanity today, the sufferings that we have to deal with, the traumas that we have to deal with are beyond your imagination. So as I was myself putting that effort, and all those women were amazingly enthusiastic about holding the Palestinian Women's Summit. Look how civilized are the Palestinian women. We wanted to connect with women from all around the world in showing the brand of Palestine through the woman's eyes. Mm. We wanted to become as a brand for Palestine. Mm. Yet, who hindered that possibility? The Israeli military occupation continues to hinder every other opportunity we seek to get seen, to bring about a better future for us on the individual level or on the collective level. All right. So, Dr. Dalal, I, I could ask so many more questions. Thank you for, for, for sharing that. And I hope that um, this bloodshed that is happening right now will come to an end soon. We'll, let's take some questions. Sure, sure. Okay, and so I'm going to first start by calling on some of my students, and then we'll open it up to uh, the rest of the audience, as has become our practice. So the first question I will call on uh, Maya Ilani, if Maya is here. Oh, there she is. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, and for this talk. My question is, you've been in this talk and in other writings been very critical about the failure of the international community to protect and to defend Palestinian human rights, but also um, sovereignty and self-determination. 
And my question to you is not so much about the past, but about the future. There are two, at least two great powers in the world right now, the US and the UK, that have been rumored to talk about um, recognizing a Palestinian state, but in the 67 borders. And I know that you've also previously said that you think the two-state solution is dead and it's only a one-state solution. Um, no, I saw an interview in 28. Okay, but my question is, do you think that would be a useful step forward to protect for the international community to take in the 67 border or does it need to be the entire territory from the Jordan River to the sea for it to be effective? Can we answer immediately or want to take what, what, what do you prefer? You want to take a cut or you want to answer immediately? I'm a better we answer, no? Okay, go ahead. Sure. Vlad Fadali. Thank you, Maya. Well, uh, the international community has, um, every member state of the international community has legal and ethical obligations when it comes to maintaining security and peace, not only for the Palestinians, but for all humanity. Um, they also have an obligation to stop the genocide, according to the ICJ and the Genocide Convention. Uh, they also have the obligation to stop the forced eviction orders that we have been seeing in, in Gaza. Uh, because in Gaza, people are now suffocated in Rafah, in hopes that those people will flee into Sinai. And this is the Israeli project that was literally spelled out in the Israeli military intelligence plan that was leaked on the 13th of October. For those of you who haven't seen it, please go Google it on 972, which is an Israeli media outlet. They want to forcibly evict the Palestinian people, empty the land, ethnically cleanse us, and then annex the rest of, of the land. However, talking about the two-state solution, one lesson I can, I can share with you as a professor of conflict resolution uh, is that negotiations is only one tool to the alternative dispute resolution tools. Unfortunately, the world has been dealing with negotiations as if it is the end in itself. It's not really the, the concern of a one or versus two or the shape of the solution as long as we talk about equal rights, human rights, uh, dignity, and freedom. However, I am, as Zalal Ayakat, I'm an advocate for, advocate for the Palestinian right to self-determination. Uh, the two-state solution is the best case scenario for the two peoples to live strategically in peace and security. However, if Israel continues to reject the two-state solution, and if we tolerate seeing Netanyahu going to the UN back in September, holding that map of Israel from the river to the sea, negating any possibility for any Palestinian state, if he doesn't want it, then yes, why not for a one state where everybody has um, equal rights? But to continue to advocate for the two-state solution from the different members of the international community, while only they procrastinate and buy time for, for Israel and the right-wing Israeli government to confiscate more lands, build more settlements, and deprive the Palestinians, suffocate them, and murder them on a daily basis, this should not be tolerated. And we should not expect the Palestinians to just remain silent. Uh, Thank you. Roy. Professor Masood, thank you for the opportunity. I came here open-minded. I don't believe anymore in the integrity of Dr. Ericat, so I withdraw my, my question. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Merav. Dal Ericat is very democratic, so you can feel free to leave the room if you want to. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's, uh, uh, Merav. On that side over there. Right there. Sam? Yep. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I live, <clears throat> I live in a village uh, near Kfo Saba for uh, you that not familiar with the, the area. It's the narrowest part between uh, the Green Line and, uh, and the sea in Israel. Um, my, my home is, uh, the, the distance between my home and the Green Line is similar to the uh, distance between Kibbutz Be'eri and Gaza border. I strongly support the two-state solution, and I even think that it will be a tragedy if from those events uh, this process won't uh, mature for, for uh, some kind of agreement. However, um, I'm thinking of my neighbors in my village, and I'm thinking of what telling them in order to convince them that they could be that they could feel safe the day after this process will start. Because Israelis remember 
Oslo. What they remember from Oslo is, uh, is Hamas bombing uh, buses in Israel streets. So I'm curious what do you think I should tell them in order to convince them that this kind of process will uh, make, them, make them feel safe. Uh, thank you, Mirav. Mirav, thank you very much. I'm very familiar with Kfar Saba. And I am married to uh, a very nice guy from Kalkilia in the north, which borders Kfar Saba. He used to eat his ice cream as he was a child in Kfar Saba. But because of the apartheid wall that was constructed between Kalkilia and Kfar Saba, he cannot go anymore. Listen, after October, it is very important for all of us who are keen to have a better future for us and our kids and our um, friends and to continue to reside there is to stand for our responsible leadership and to say and act upon what we say, not only say things. I had many Israeli friends in my life, okay? Unfortunately, I lost most of the moderates now and I know that. It's a sad reality. It's a very sad reality. We lost the moderates on both sides because of the level of atrocities, because of the levels of impunity, because I don't want to go into a blame game here, mm. but I want to focus on our responsibility here in bringing things forward. If we are passionate in bringing change to our societies, if we want to bring a positive, uh, new future for, for Gaza to be, you know, the Saint-Tropez of, of the Middle East, why not? For any humanity, I think for your friends and for my friends and for my family who is now in a tent in Rafah, in Gaza, who cannot leave the border. The only thing that we need to agree that we need to provide is freedom, is security, is dignity, is human rights, is education, is normality. Mirav, I live in Palestine. I used to live abroad. When I came back to Palestine as a mother, you know, the, the complexity of questions that I have to answer with sanity to my, to my kids is not imaginable. Yeah. We are being adapted to the abnormal. So if we can urge, really, the leaders, the leaders to sign a mega comprehensive peace deal that would grant the Israelis their uh, uh, security and peace. But at the same time, we should not neglect the fact that the Palestinians' peace and security and the human rights should be also treated in that deal on equal basis. So if we grant the Palestinians, for example, their rights of mobility, of education, of investing in areas C, in digging their water wells, which are prohibited by the Israelis. Why would the Palestinians, what would the Palestinians resist in that um, scenario? I think we need to think forward that for any humanity, everybody wants a decent life, a decent family, you know, good job, uh, parks around, good schooling system. This is not the reality that we have been, you know, facing or living under the Israeli military occupation. You know, I assume you're Israeli. You know, for the Palestinians and Israelis to see each other, the only encounter for any Palestinian with an Israeli is on the checkpoints. So the only image of an Israeli in the Palestinian eye is the soldier who is carrying the gun and pointing it at my, my car or my kids or like threatening my, 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 my human well-being. Yeah. So I think we need wisdom, and I think we need responsible leadership. But we also need to avoid repetitive tactics and strategies that have been tried before. So we should not be saying, yeah, let's go back to the negotiating table. It doesn't take a genius. It really doesn't take a genius. If we all respect conflict resolution based on the two-state solution, let's do it tomorrow morning. Let's draw the border of the state of Israel. Let's define that border. Yeah. Let's end the Israeli military occupation. Let us recognize bluntly the Palestinian state. Yeah. I think that's how you make people feel safe. Not by what you tell them, but what actions do they see being implemented on the grounds?
Thank you, Madam. To, to an Israeli who says to you know because the the, the hypothesis that you just offered is would, was that if the Israelis start to allow Palestinians to have more mobility, if the Israelis you know provide the Palestinians, no, not as in a favor. No, not as, 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 right. as their as their human rights. That what you, I think I'm quoting you. What is there for Palestinians to resist there? An Israeli will come back to you and say, "Look, there are some Palestinians, maybe even most Palestinians, who just object to our presence here." That's not true. And I reject this. Uh, this, this is again propaganda. I mean, it's in the Hamas this charter is, and Hamas. Thank you for bringing this up. Thank yes. you very much. Yes. How many of you are aware that Hamas actually amended their charter? That Hamas actually accepted the two-state solution on the 67 border lines. Yes. Please, guys, go read. Yeah. Please go read. You, you could forgive an Israeli for thinking that that commit was, was is not very credible, yes. given what happened on October seventh. Yeah, but that's that's done. That's a big achievement that we should not undermine. Yeah. Okay. Should, that's why you're human beings at the end of the day. Let me let me let me get take more sure. questions sure. for you. Sure. Okay. So I have um, just raise your hand really high. So I'm going to try to get some uh, diversity. So I'll come to my soon and then Noam. Um, thank you, Dr. Dalal. I, um, my question is on immediate um, next steps in peace talks. Um, as you know, in the news today, um, the Hamas delegation left Cairo claiming that Israel thwarted the negotiations. Israel said that there is no um, offering to give like return the hostages. Um, I heard moments earlier that the complete return of hostages for a complete ceasefire would be Hamas getting everything it wanted. Now, with this narrative, what I hear is shrinking civility of the Palestinian people, stripping away their civility because of who represents them or who they support, and that's dangerous in international law. Now, how can we move past that, and what are immediate next steps so that we can come to a ceasefire? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I can easily say uh, ceasefire is common sense for anybody who believes in humanity nowadays. Not because uh, Ramadan is approaching, but because it should not be okay that for six months, we have been witnesses to war crimes that are documented on every screen, that the, where the targets are children and women, civilians, unarmed people, while the Israeli military is using an AI-generated gospel machine that is very quantitative rather than qualitative under the pretext of targeting Hamas. Nobody can convince, um, convince me rationally that Israel doesn't have the capacity to determine or locate where the Israeli, the, the Hamas bases are. They did assassinate just uh, a couple of weeks ago the guy in Beirut in the middle of his office. So to continue to kill and to destroy the human infrastructure in Gaza under the pretext of Hamas is something that needs our thinking, guys, all of our thinking. Israel needs to stop, and the impunity that it enjoys needs to stop. You know, all the aid that Israel had been receiving from the U.S. and the like-minded countries under the name of um, the right to self-defense is basically a justification for the more killings and murders and deprivation of the Palestinian people. This should not be okay. Sure. But on Hamas, I want to also uh, um, clarify one thing. You might, you might hear some Palestinians, you know, cheering, cheering Hamas. I want to tell you one thing. The people who might be, you know, or seem to be uh, as if they are fans of Hamas are not really fans of the ideology. There is, there is a big difference of being a fan or an advocate, advocate of the Palestinian right to struggle, under the Israeli military occupation, the Palestinian right to self-defense and to freedom, and in believing in a certain ideology. I just want you to draw a fine line when you think about the Palestinian people and themselves being fans of Hamas. What about fans of October 7th? If, you, if we were to poll Palestinians about As I said, Tara, October 7th for apparently many Westerns uh, has started and ended on October 7th. For me, October 7th is ongoing until March 7th, until tomorrow, as long as our people are dying. As I said, and I repeat, we need wisdom. We need committed, responsible leaders who are ready to say yes to what came as reference to the peace process 30 years ago. Yeah. We don't need to reinvent any wheels. Just whoever believes in the two-state solution need to come and draw the border of the state of Israel, need to end the Israeli military occupation, need to grant the Palestinians back their basic freedoms and rights in self-determination, in statehood, 
but you're a scholar of politics. I mean, forget, forget about the, the moral point. I mean, just politically, how do you do that after October 7th? What guarantee, okay. you know, to come to Mirab's question, what guarantee can you give the Israeli that, you know, there's not going to be any more October 7th? It seems like you're saying, look, October 7th happened because you're denying us our freedom. Give us our freedom. October 7th won't happen anymore. Uh, you could forgive an Israeli for that, not being terribly just, convinced by that. It's really sad that um, we're only talking about the framework of October 7th uh, by, while negating all the sufferings and the injustices and the cruelty and heinous act by the Israeli. I agree, but I don't you blame Hamas happening. for that? Don't, don't you think, you know, I'm furious. Here's another question. I hate to play the blame game. We're in a very bad situation and we need to have and engage in this difficult conversation for things to be taken forward, Tarek. So, for example, if you ask me, how do I see things going forward, politically speaking? Yeah. I am inspired by the Northern Ireland, Ireland um, uh, case study. Yeah. You know, the British, the UK and the US recognized that the Good Friday Agreement could have never been reached without the inclusion of the IRA, which is the military wing of the Shen Fen at that time. It's not about, you know, exclusion that brings peace and deals. No, it's about including everybody. And I would tell you, I mean, what, what, what does Hamas want? It's only a power struggle. It's a power sharing struggle. They need to come at the table. Like we did with the IRA in Northern Ireland. You know, it has been, it has been tried and it has been successful. I mean, so I, why, I, don't we, why don't we go for it? No, who wants to kill you all? Who are you? So, so, so let, let's, can we please, can we just, speaking on behalf can we just please, everybody, please help me. Because I've been trying to tell the world that we can have these conversations at Harvard like adults and we're going to do it. We're going to succeed. So, first of all, put up your hand and I will call on you. So, um, okay, I have a long list. Okay, I'm going to try to get through that um, Get through that list. I, I forgot next. your name. Andrew. No, not Andrew, the one behind. <laughs> I, I not, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, you know, I was going to, I was going to ask you a question, but I'm not. I'm going to uh, hold my, so I have Noam. Um, thank you for coming. You really touched my heart in many ways. I'm an Israeli. I'm a strong supporter of the Palestinian right for a state. I'm willing to pay high prices for this. I have a lot of criticism to the Israeli government and to Israelis. And still being um, practical, forward-looking, when you're talking about responsible leadership and wisdom, don't you think it will be better or an opportunity now for Palestinian leaders like yourself to actually not insist on on the Ham on like looking at everyone as Palestinians and, and, and use this opportunity to say we reject the approach of Hamas, at least Hamas um, military arm, and we want to offer another approach, more constructive approach, and like use this opportunity to to disconnect because you were insisting on on we are all Palestinians, we shouldn't look only um, on these separations. So I wonder if it might be better for the Palestinian cause for this to the chances of a two state solution. Thank you, thank you, Noam. Well, I did not advocate for the tools used by Hamas here. But the fact that Hamas, many, many Hamas members are Palestinians, this is a fact. You know, to accept the narration of Netanyahu that he will eradicate Hamas and that he will eliminate Hamas, this is irrational. This is irrational. This is ridiculous to, to believe. He, he can. He can destroy some military bases. But as I said... Yeah. As Palestinians? Yes. yes. We want peace. Can, can I, we want an imposed peace, not through negotiations. International law is very clear. Yeah. The terms for the two-state solution are very clear. Never going to happen. But it can happen with a mega deal with the Saudis coming on board. Oh, good, good luck. I want to be visionary, yes. I want to be creative. I want to give Israel its, um, you know, um, whatever it's, it's seeking in the Gulf world. But yet, listen, as long as the Palestinians are not at the table, 
no security, no peace in the Middle East will be granted as we wish. Why are you saying Hamas is the Palestinians? Can I, can I, I didn't say that. I said many Hamas members are at the end of the day are Palestinians. But can I, can I, so, you, you know, know, the fact that he keeps going to Hamas is actually um, articulated in this military intelligence plan. This is their communication tactic to keep uh, spinning everything around Hamas. Please read it. You'll find everything there. It's their communication strategy. But, but, yeah. I, uh, what? We have been offering that approach for 30 years. I tell you, my own father, he left Earth without realizing his dreams, without delivering to me. Yeah. I, I get, I, you know, I guess, you know, I'll ju just, I guess what she's trying to say is that just as political expedients, you know, for the Palestinians who, like yourself, do represent a more uh, liberal. Uh, we just actually, yeah. you know, we just, we just announced in Palestine a new technocratic, you know, formation of a new technocratic government. This is a political step forward. I know. But, so that, that's an effort. What no, did we see on the Israeli side? No rejection so, of... Talking about reciprocity. But you know, I have a ton of Israelis. I have a ton of Israelis who will come to me and say, we hate Ben Gvir, we hate Smotrich, we condemn them, etc. And I have many Palestinian friends who are the most humane, honorable people I have ever met. But if I ever say, to, I would never even ask them to say like, hey, can you condemn Hamas in the same way that these guys condemn Ben Gvir and Smotrich? Because I know they won't do it. And I... I don't know why they won't do it. So we're not talking about you. Just explain that to us. You want to take more questions? As a social scientist. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. The next question I have is from Andrew. We'll, we'll take we'll take three more questions. And I'm no, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question actually builds on this last discussion. You're from Ramallah. I actually was just hoping you could tell us a little bit about What's happening politically in the West Bank? What is the status of the legitimacy, the capacity of the Palestinian Authority? <laughs> um, what are some of the political uh, uh, developments that are happening there that we might not be aware of since uh, I, I, October 7, I think, is the date? Great, great question. Uh, lame joke, though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the PNO doesn't enjoy authorities. It's called the Palestinian National Authority, but without any authorities. You know, even if our president wants to leave from Ramallah to Jericho, not to Amman per se, he needs a permission from the Israeli authorities. This is a fact that everybody should know and that we should not try to, to say. Every Palestinian lives under the Israeli military occupation. The Israelis decide on every detail of our lives, whatever comes in, whatever comes out. We are living since October 7th in Ramallah. I was born in Jerusalem, by the way. I did not mention that. So in my ID, it says born in Jerusalem. I usually obtain permits to go to Jerusalem, hold meetings, do some businesses. Since October 7th, I cannot enter Jerusalem. All our permits are canceled, permanently canceled, despite the uh, security clearances that, that we use, used to have. So for example, if I have any medical emergency, nothing could get me to a good medical service uh, beyond the border. Every morning, we see Israeli troops in Palestinian downtowns, including Ramallah. Every uh, uh, now and then our schools shut down and convert to online learning, not because of a COVID, not because of a pandemic, but because the Israeli military troops decide to invade the city at a certain hour in the morning. Settler terrorism is a really threat to anybody who wants to work for peace in the future. Those are armed settlers who have no principles, excuse me. They don't see any humans when it comes to the Palestinians. So the situation is really the Palestinians being very, very suffocated. We live in our own cities. Even if I want to go and visit my mom, as I said, I would think twice before taking the decision because let alone the checkpoints and the deprivation and the dehumanization acts on the checkpoints, I would be scared from the settler terror who can attack me and my kids at any moment, at any juncture. This is the reality that we are living. As I said, we're, adapt we're being adapted to the abnormal. We don't enjoy any equal human rights. Just in our small cities, my students cannot make it to the university because of the Israeli checkpoints and closures. That could happen randomly and in any place. 
Many universities had converted to online learning for the past semester, uh, all through the, the semester. The doctors, the nurses cannot commute between their city of residence and the city of service. Mm -hmm. The teachers, the patients, who, they, they cannot... It's really catastrophic, the situation. Yet, the Israeli regime, this right-wing government, Smotrich, Benigfir, are provoking more settler terrorism. And you have heard the, the pogroms that took place in Huwara, in Sinjil, in Ain Samia. You know, the fourth evictions orders that are taking place in Khan al-Ahmar, in, uh, in Ain Samia, in the Jordan Valley, even the growers and the farmers in Jericho, all, all uh, around the, the, the Jordan Valley, they face settler attacks on daily basis. The trees are being uprooted. The people are being attacked. The situation is very catastrophic. So if something, you know, explodes soon, Please don't blame it on the Palestinian people. Mm. The level of dehumanization is really hard to explain. We need to take one, one more question. So, uh, Eli. Uh, Dr. Dalal, thank you so much for coming. Um, I think this is the third in the in the dialogues, and um, honestly, I think in some ways you had quite an easy job coming in. I think that almost everyone in this audience is really shocked and disgusted by what's happening to the people of Gaza, the overwhelming death, the, the horrors of the occupation, and, and I'm really grateful for you sharing some of your personal experience and your family in Raqqa. Um, what's confusing to me, though, is that you came in, I think, with an audience that was really willing to listen and hear why a ceasefire is needed now and, and generally agrees with you. But you started by talking about um, the importance of veritas truth and of the Socratic method. And then the first thing you said in response to, to Dr. Massoud's question was a lie that's really, really easy to find out the answer to. So if you put back on the, um, the first tweet, which you said was at 6 a.m. before anyone knew, that's 6 a.m. American time. So it, it was two in the afternoon local time. Just and, and you know that because you tweeted it. And so the thing. That, no, no, go back to my tweet and listen, listen. Hang on, let, I, I, let, me, let me get to let me get to the question. So the question is, and it's a variation on on the theme Maybe everyone else has asked until the evening that day. By the way, just to make things clear. Um, the question that I'm asking and that a lot of other people asked as well is, what do you think is the most effective way to win over people? Because I think as far as I can tell from the reaction of many in the room, people have come in very sympathetic to your cause. And while they might be sympathetic to your cause, have left not sympathetic to you. So I think how, how can we like uh, have a, a method that makes people understand what's going on in Gaza without uh, making it combative? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. May, may I rephrase the question just a little bit? Because first of all... I'm okay. 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 It's interesting that you're speaking on behalf of the room, while they, I didn't see them giving you that permission. Um, it was 6.45 a.m. my time, by the way, and nothing was reported on the casualties on the Israeli side until that evening. Again, I express every empathy with every person, no matter who, no matter where, that suffered and who is still suffering. Mm -hmm. Nothing can justify violence in my eyes, okay? But... I don't take things personal, so if you don't want to like me, it's up to you. The Palestinian cause is not the Lal Arakat's cause, it's the Palestinian cause. And I told myself after this biased media campaign that came after Tariq uh, had announced my participation, that this is not against me personally. This is against the truth. This is against anybody who dares to criticize the actions of the Israeli military occupation. And as I come here today from Palestine, I also promised myself to come with the intention of holding this difficult yet constructive conversation that we all need. We all need. I don't want to win any arguments today. Trust me. I really don't want to win any arguments. I'm not here to win arguments. I'm here to try to address your brains and to provoke the thinking of everyone to try to think more, learn more, be curious about learning. Never take what I say and or whoever comes and, and says for granted. That's why we're granted with brains. So I don't take anything personal. And I hope to see you in, in future events and then maybe we can do something together to help humanity in, in the region.
Inshallah. Can I, so, so we're we're running out of time, and I wanted to say just w one uh, thing, uh, also in response to Eli's question. So, you know, I don't know how timestamps on on Twitter work, but you know, w one thing that one should be attentive to is just the different information environments that people live in, and particularly on that day and in the early hours of that day. People lived in very different information environments. I remember telling some uh, 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 fellow Arabs that this was a horrific thing that was happening, and they thinking that I was uh, was insane because they were seeing completely different media. They were seeing Hamas fighters. Uh, penetrating military targets, whereas I was seeing the scene of Hamas fighters with the, the body of that um, uh, poor Israeli woman. So I do think people also lived in different media environments. But you also I, have seen some videos where some Arabic um, voices were saying, no, 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 this is military, this is civilian, stay away from them. Yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot um, to, to, to talk about there. But the, the bottom line point that I just want to make is, you know, sometimes people should take yes for an answer. And the fact that you uh, uh, reiterated that you would never uh, consider the killing of innocent civilians, the rape of people, as a normal struggle for freedom, I think is a very important and courageous thing for you to have said. And I'm, I'm grateful for, to you for doing that. I, I will say, Dr. Delal, when, when, when I invited you uh, back when we first met in um, March of 2023, I believed and I still believe that um, you have a very important voice, that you are a very, uh, that you're a humane person. You're a Palestinian nationalist. You're not a, an Israeli nationalist. Nationalist, you're, you're somebody who seeks, you know, your people's freedom, etc. And um, and I, I I hope I, I look from this day until the day of judgment, Israelis and Palestinians are going to live together. Okay, they're the only two people whom God has decreed are going to live like this together. Okay, it's a Catholic marriage, if if we if if I will. And the way, for this Catholic marriage to work, it's going to require people of enormous empathy and goodwill and broad minds on both sides to forge these kinds of camps for, for peace. So you're and I you hosted me. I believe and I still believe that you are, uh, are one of those people on the, on the Palestinian side. And I hope that uh, we will um, have further opportunities to talk with you and argue with you. And I want to thank you again for coming here. I know that in the, the news uh, stories surrounding your visit could not have made this seem like it was going to be a hospitable place. So I'm very grateful to you for coming and sharing your insights. Thank you. And I want to end with um, two thoughts. How many of you have visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC? Okay, I visited the Holocaust Museum at an early stage of my life, because I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn, and I learned a lot. For those who did not go, once you go and visit, go to the second floor and look at the map that is held in the Holocaust Museum, and you will see what we are trying to bring back to the world, Palestine as a state on the map. Thank you very much for hosting me. However, I want to also end by saying and repeating our role as academics in bringing about a more um, informed discourse and to engage in those difficult conversations. As an academic, it was not okay for me to see Dean Douglas, for example, commenting to the American media outlets on my comments as being abhorrent. One-on-one -on -one academia is investigation, is inquiry, you know, climbing up the ladder of inference. And then you told them, had I seen the tweets, I wouldn't have invited her. We looked at my tweets, we had a rigorous analysis yeah. without any intentions of judging somebody, yeah. but more of, you know, being oriented and focused on really searching the truth and what could bring us together. Yeah. I am a Palestinian yeah. woman, mother, professor who dares to teach conflict resolution in Palestine under the Israeli military occupation. I want to remind you that we all have a responsibility today towards the Middle East, toward the Palestinians, toward the Israelis, towards bringing peace. But we need to say the truth, and we need to deal in the theory of conflict resolution with the root cause of what is causing all those atrocities. We all need to be saying there must be an end, an immediate end to the Israeli military occupation. We can have a two-state solution. 
once this military occupation ends and once the border of the state of Israel is defined. But to continue to tolerate civilized rhetoric without actions on the ground is something that those of us who are concerned and keen to bring about a prosperous, positive future for our people, the Palestinians and the Israelis alike, we should ask for people to walk their talks. Thank you very much, Tariq. Okay, thank you, Dalal. We're going to have to end the first. Thank you.